giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory, maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your word, king over all of the universe, to you be the glory. This is my prayer in the desert when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer in my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the fire, in weakness or trial or pain. There is a faith proved of more worth than gold. So refine me, Lord, through the flames. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice and I will declare. God is my victory and he is here. He 
This is my prayer in the battle when triumph is still on its way. I am a conqueror, a co heir with Christ. So firm on his promise, I'll stand and I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. And I will rejoice. And I will It is so good to be back here at Believer's Fellowship and see all these faces this morning. I missed you guys last week, so it's good to be back and see you guys. For those who are watching online, you guys, we have been adding to our numbers every single week to our online viewers. So those guests that are watching online, we would love to see you here in person. But until then, we'd like to get to know you. If you'll go to bfchurch.com, click on the guest tab, fill out a little bit of information so that we can get to know you. So that when you're ready to come here in person, we already know who to look for. For those who are here in person, we'd like to greet each other. We're going to do that by standing up, walk around, and welcome each other.
All right, if everybody returns to their seats, remain standing. If everybody return to their seats. All right, we are going to go to the Lord and his word. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. and truth leave you, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be overflowed with new wine. Let us pray. Dear Lord, dear Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you and thank you so much for your mercy and your grace that's so undeserved. Lord, we thank you for our church and our pastors. Lord, we ask you that you would protect Pastor Joe and Pastor Gary and Gary Eaton and all the others that are traveling to Cuba, that, that they're ministering to these precious people there. Watch over their families while they are away and keep them safe. May many in Cuba come to know Jesus as their Savior because our pastor's faithfulness and love for them. Lord, we pr may we pray faithfully and constantly as a church body and a nation for our country and leaders that have turned so far away from you. Lord, please save them and help them to turn back to you, I pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for the overturn of Roe versus Wade. But Lord, I just want to pray now for those whose hearts don't understand that life begins at conception and that every life is precious to you. Thank you for forgiving our sins, Lord, and may we in turn always have forgiving hearts. Please use this message this morning to speak to our deepest needs. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. this. 
abounds in deepest waters your sovereign hand will be my guide where feet may fail and fear surrounds me you've never failed and you won't start now and I Savior, let me deeper than 
my soul rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. Amen and amen. Good morning. Welcome to church. Glad you're here to worship with us today. If you're online viewing, uh, get on down to the house of God. If you can't get here, you stay online. Just don't go anywhere else. Amen. <laughs> we are glad you're here to worship with us today. Uh, I'm continuing with a series of messages I started last week, Overcoming Recession Depression. And I started this sermon last week talking about all those depressing things. So I, I was almost depressed by just going over those notes. So I'm going to save you the depression part and just let you know that the, 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 uh, the economy is depressing. Uh, about everywhere you look in the world today, uh, that, that's uh, bad on so many fronts. Now, I'm getting ready to go to Cuba. Pastor Gary and I are on Tuesday, so it's good on that front because the dollar stands pretty good against the Cuban peso. So, praise the Lord, we're able to do a little more down there with the money we spend. So, that's a blessing. But as you look around and see what's going on in the world today, there are so many things that are that are just negative, you know. And interesting part about that for the child of God, you don't have to be regulated by those things. You know, when you walk in the room in the mornings, we get up at the church, and we, have, we have these things called thermostats coming in your home. They're on automatic timers, but you can go back there and just set the, the temperature wherever you want it. I wish we could do that with the economy. It just doesn't work that way. But you can do it with your personal life and your personal heart. You get to, according to what the Bible teaches, you can set your economy wherever you want. You may not believe that. But in other words, you don't have to let the world regulate your attitude, your economy. As Christians, as children of God, we are part of another kingdom. And that uh, monetary world knows nothing about recession or depression or economic failure. It has succeeded from day one and continues to succeed today. And the Bible tells us as children of God, we're to live in that spirit life and in that spirit world. So we can trust the Lord no matter what happens. When the world is looking for answers and clamoring and complaining and bickering and depressed... Uh, we can look up, we can trust the Lord, and know that he is faithful to provide everything. You know, I even look at the children of Israel as they were wandering through the wilderness in 40 years of just being backslidden as you could possibly get, you know. And still, in the midst of all that, God continued to meet all their needs. They didn't miss a meal. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. You know, for God just sustained them the whole time that they were in the wilderness, even when they really weren't right with God. I believe that God meets the needs of every child of God. In fact, I believe that if God's not meeting your needs, something's desperately wrong. Check this number one, am I a child of God? That's always the best place to start, amen? amen. Check your citizenship papers. Do you really belong to Jesus, all right? Number two, am I living my life in accordance to the principles that God's Word lays down? So it doesn't matter today where you are, by the way, age-wise in this, whether you're one of the young persons in our auditorium today or the oldest person in our auditorium today. These principles apply. The best thing a parent can do is teach his children these principles and teach them young. Now, whether they maintain them after they leave their home, that's another thing. But you've taught them and you were faithful to teach them about the faithfulness of God and how that we can rely on the promises of God and you need to learn that, you know, that, that's what the Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, made that statement. says, you know, learn these things while you're young. You know, in the days of your youth, learn the most important things. And that is that God is a faithful father and he loves you and has promised to sustain you no matter what the world around you does and no matter how bad things may get. So first and foremost, overcoming recession depression is realizing that God is your faithful father and you can trust him with your supplies. I, I gave a list last week. I'll get, just give it to you real quick in case you weren't here and you missed those. But uh, the sermon last week dealt with the first three or four uh, that are on this list of what we call just biblical good principles uh, and disciplines that you can have in your life for experiencing the financial blessings of God. We said the first thing is you need to learn how to trust God. You trust God with your resources, your source. Your, you know that he's your source and supply. And you learn how to live a faith life. And that means to do what you do unto the Lord in your economic life, and even your work. You count it as a, as a blessing from God and you do it as unto the Lord. The Bible talks about whatever your hand finds to do, then you do it with all your might. In other words, don't think, well, my, my employer, I don't like him. Don't go to work and wake up in the morning grumbling about your job and your vocation. Get over yourself. Get over that. 
and learn how to say, hey, I have what I have as a gift from God, and I'm going to honor the Lord with what he's given me. If this is what it is right now, no matter how difficult it might be, or the people the Lord's put me to work around might be, this is my opportunity to show off the kingdom and to show Jesus off to a lost world. So we honor the Lord in, in that way as well. We also said keep good records of your finances. I mean, know the state of your situation, what it is, that just being disciplined in your life. Learn how to give that first portion back to God. Learn how to honor the Lord with the first portion. And we dealt a lot with these, these first four things last week. We're going to continue some of that today. But also learn how to save. Invest for the future. If you're in debt, set up a plan and a payment plan to get out of that debt. And we'll talk about that more in future sermons. Learn how to budget what you've been given, the blessings that God has given you. Don't let your circumstances control you. You get in control of what you do have. You say, not a lot. Then get in control of it now and submit that to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you learn how to be in charge, not let the world run you. That's why it's important to get out of debt. The Bible tells us that the, 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 to borrow, the person who borrows is, is servant and slave to the lender. So learn how to get out, out, out from under those, that bondage that you may have found yourself in. Learn how to budget the things you have and then enjoy what you have. Contentment is, a, is an incredible blessing if you can just get a hold of it. Most people never learn to be, with, be content. The Bible says that contentment with godliness, in other words, being, having contentment, knowing Jesus, it doesn't get any better than that. And so you learn how to be content with whatever God's blessed you. Sometimes there's, there's abundance. Sometimes there's not abundance. Sometimes there's difficulty. Sometimes there's overflow. But hey, whatever it is, you don't live with your hands always saying, you know, I just need more, I need more. Don't be like the guy who said, well, I'm not really greedy, you know. I don't want everything. I just want more. <laughs> so don't be that person. You learn, how to, learn how to exercise contentment. Don't believe the advertising. Don't believe the media that always says you're never happy or you deserve more or you should have this. Hey, get over all that stuff that the world tries to shove down your throat. Learn how to be free. And, of course, the keys to experiencing that we mentioned last week are these three important elements, and they're really just one element. It's that it, it's faith in Jesus Christ. If I do have faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to trust what the Bible says. Do I really believe the Bible? And then I'm, there's going to be obedience. If I do believe, it's going to be followed up with obedience. And you know the Bible, and I think most of you have been around the, the, in the Lord long enough to know the Bible has a great deal to say about your finances and where you are, all right, and what you're experiencing. Some of you may be in a time of blessing right now. Some of you may be in a time of what I call healing at times. And that, 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 that I'm, it's recovery time. I, I've been in a difficult time. But those principles remain the same, all right? The truth of God's word is the truth of God's word. It, it, it's still the same. And I, and I know a lot of people when it comes to giving, greed has a tendency and covetous has a tendency to, to hinder that and to, to stifle that. And it's kind of like, you know, I believe what the Bible says about that, you know, but I'm not going to do it. You know? I believe what the Bible says. It's kind of like saying, I believe God for my salvation, but I'm not really going to repent. Well, you can not believe God for anything. You know, the Bible says repent and believe. Say, I want to believe, but I don't want to repent when you haven't believed. It's two sides of really the, the same coin. So if we say we're going to really live for Jesus and love the Lord, then we should learn how to understand what it means to be a Christian in the context of our economy and our personal blessings that God gives us. We talked about last week learning to honor the Lord with what he's given you. You say, well, I, I just have a part-time job, or I'm young, I'm still in school, but I do work. Hey, learn how to honor the Lord. The Bible tells us that if you can learn to be faithful in that which is little or least, then God will make you master over much. But you take a person who can't be even faithful over the little things, it's doubtful they'll ever be master over much, or at least as much as that God really wanted to give them. We talked last week about those first things about realizing that God's our supplier. The, the way I express my faith in that is I learn how to give a portion of what I've been given. You say, how much is the portion? I believe there is a biblical model. I believe that God, if you just study the Bible, that there's this biblical model that God gives us. And I believe that portion is a tenth of what the Lord has blessed us with, that we learn how to give it back. It's just a portion. As we said last week, it's one thin dime. On a dollar. Well, that's a dime. Yeah, it's a dime. It's just a dime. It's not a dollar. It's one portion of that dollar, of each dollar. And we said, this is something that goes back. A lot of people say, well, that's just the law. This, this dates in the Bible way uh, hundreds of years before the law was ever given. And we saw those illustrations last week. So I won't spend a lot of time there. Just say we saw the illustration of first fruits giving, that it was pre-law. 
Remember, the law came under Moses, and in the Scripture we have these illustrations about those who gave a portion of their income before the law of Moses, and that was Abraham. This Scripture teaches us in Galatians 3 that Abraham was a man of faith, not of the law. He was a man of grace. He trusted the Lord, and he demonstrated it by giving a portion. In one place it says he gave a tenth of what he had to Melchizedek, and the, the Scriptures say that that was a... He was a type, Melchizedek was a priest unto the Lord. He was a type of the Lord himself. Jacob had made an oath that he gave everything, a portion, 10% of everything he got from, 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 the, from the blessings that God had given him back to the Lord. And then we see that there's that story of Cain and Abel that we dealt more with last week, how that, you know, uh, Cain and Abel's offerings were brought, but one brought the right portion and the other did not bring the right portion in Scripture. Some like, well, that's not what that means. And one brought a blood offering, one brought a grain offering. The Bible says you could bring either offering in, in Scripture, so either offering would be. But if we're going to be people of faith, then there's this proportional giving that we, we recognize that God's really the source. And I honor the Lord for blessing me the way he's blessed me by giving a portion back. It really is, long before the law of Moses, in the New Testament and prior to the law of Moses, you see that giving was an act of faith, all right, and worship. Hebrews 11 mentions the offerings of, of, Ab, of Abel, and it says that by faith he gave an offering. So I do give a tenth of, of my income, all right? As an offering to the Lord, as I receive my income, I give, to begin with, a portion to the Lord, and that is 10% of how he's blessed me, that pay period or whatever it might be. Remember, in the Bible, there was this agricultural economy where people made a living off their crops or off their herds, right? And so you didn't get, you didn't get money the 1st and 15th or every Friday or what it might be, but as the harvest came in or as the flock was born, then they would give off that, how they were blessed, the, 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 the 10% of that. It's different in our culture and economy today. We have these measurable incomes that we get, and so we measure back to the Lord how he's blessed us. But why do we do it? Because of the law? No, we're under grace. We do it because the Bible gives us this the obvious illustration. Even in Hebrews, when it's talking about those Old Testament offerings, it says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent offering. And remember, that more excellent in the Greek language didn't have to do with the quality, that he gave a better quality offering than his brother. It says he gave the right quantity of offering. So just to rehearse what I said last week, in a nutshell, as long as time has existed, God has reserved one-seventh of time from us to be given back to him as honor. That's why we honor the Lord with Sundays. This is the Lord's day. I give myself to the Lord on this day. I give myself to hearing from the Lord and fellowshipping with the people of God. And This is the Lord's day. The second part of that, as long as man has had material possessions, we have honored the Lord with a portion, one-tenth of what he's bestowed upon us. So it's always amazed me. He said, well, I don't do that because it's the law. Well, I think just because you're under grace, you'd want to do that at least as a minimal because there is this model that's given to us to, to give the, at least this. We said last week, one dime on a dollar. Come on, get over it. It's nothing. You know, if, if I ask you for a dime, some of you might laugh and give me a quarter. <laughs> right? Well, let's give the Lord a quarter. On the dollar, and see, I know that's another story. Tithing under the law of Moses was different. We closed with this slides last week that talked about those. There was there was a second and a third tithe that Moses that he wrote into the law that God gave him to write into the law. Deuteronomy 12 and 6 it said that that those offerings, the second offering that he introduced, the first was the original offerings that under Adam and Eve and Abel and, and you know Cain and and all of them and and Abraham and Jacob, but there were these two other tithes that were added. And the, the second tithe was added to, to basically finance the Feast of Israel and those feasts that are mentioned there. The second tithe that was added, which is the third tithe, but under, under the, the order of things, but it was given in Deuteronomy 14, and it was for strangers and for the fatherless and for the widows. And that tithe was a tithe that was, it, that tithe wasn't received every year under the law. It was every other year it was received under the law to take care of the fatherless and the widows and, and, and the people who had no means of taking care of themselves. And so those were instituted to deal with that. And that was in the third year, excuse me. Every third year, they would take an, an offering of the increase. Now, under the law, according to the scripture, it says that the, seed, the law was added until the seed come. Now, in scripture, that means until the promised Messiah would come, all right? And that's Jesus, we know. So we're not under the law, all right? Say amen. 
We don't follow those, those, those laws and that structure. We're under the grace of God. There's nothing we can do to prove our righteousness. Jesus has given us righteousness. But I think we should still understand that everything I have comes from the Lord, and I should honor the Lord with what I've been given. And I've been given this, 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 this obvious symbol here and this obvious principle throughout Scripture. But I've learned first and foremost that I just give it to the Lord. It's not, I don't even think it's mine to keep. I, it's just an obligatory offering of my faith and my worship. Uh, it, I, I can't say it's really mine because it's it, it really everything I have belongs to the Lord. But I can only be bringing it to the Lord. I can give it out of faith and I give it as an act of worship. And it just shows that hey, I, I'm a faithful manager of what God has blessed me with, and what God has given me. And I I recognize and prove that I'm a faithful manager to myself, first and foremost, because greed can certainly get a hold of our heart. But unto the Lord is an act of worship to him that I love you, Lord, and here's the, here's the first portions of what I have. Before, you know, I, I, I don't write the checks, all right? Uh, you don't probably write the checks in, in, where you work, perhaps. You get a check, and out of that check comes, you know, it shows you what you made, and then it says, oh, and the government took this much. They just, they, they, Without your permission, they did it anyway. Just stole it right out of your account. And then, you know, but before that, I, my recognition is before I even get the stub or see a stub, hey, I know the first portion that's going to the Lord. In our home, we've learned to go beyond just a portion like that and learn the benefits of not only tithing or 10 percenting or first fruiting it, but also adding an offering to that beyond that that honors the Lord in some, in, in some way in my life. So we understood, hey, it's just a portion. The second thing we talked about last week was it teaches us the meaning of real stewardship. I've learned how to truly be a steward of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm, I'm taking the time to do as Jesus said. I give unto Caesar what's Caesar's. I give unto God what's God. In other words, there's something that's God's. Just as much, remember what they were talking to Jesus about? And so Jesus, you know, says, sends Peter down to get tax money from the fish. Don't you wish you'd get yours that way? And he takes the coin and holds it up and says, whose image is on this coin? Well, you might say in America, oh, that's Ben Franklin or that's George Washington or whatever. It's, it's Caesar's image. He said, then you give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, the portion's his. But think about it. Then you render unto who? God. What is God's? Well, whose image is on us? It's God's image. So we give the Lord. Yes, all of us, but we recognize and we worship him with a portion of the blessings that he's given us, we render unto his. Now, this is where I stopped last week, but I didn't get to point three, four, five, which let me just get to you real quick. Point three was first fruits giving is the gateway to really experiencing the goodness and the blessings of God, all right? It is meant to be a blessing, not an obligation. It's meant to be a joy. It's meant to, to keep the... the, the the floodgates of heaven open to keep the windows of heaven open for you to enjoy your worship and to really secure your heart to glorify God. So many people don't comprehend this, you know, that there's this portion. And, and in fact, when it comes to, he, in Malachi, he calls it, the, you take it to the storehouse, which was the temple. The New Testament storehouse is the, is the body of Christ, the church. So we, we, we offer our first fruits there to the body of Christ, to the fellowship that God's called, to the bride of Christ, and we honor the Lord by honoring the bride of Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, I shared with you last week that that first tithe was given to maintain the ministries that God had. As the temple was later built to maintain the, the priesthood and the Levites, to pay them, to take care of sustaining their families and feeding them, these first tithes were given. But then the Levites were also required to tithe off everything they got to the high priest. So, again, everybody, everybody has a part. There's no exemption for pastors. There's no exemption for being a Sunday school teacher. There's no exemption for being an elder. There's no exemption for being a musician. There's no exemption. Those are your talents, all right? We serve the Lord with our talent. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that's within me, all right? We give the Lord. We also serve the Lord with our time. And I can't say, well, I don't like to give money, so I'm just going to give a little more time. It doesn't work that way. God's interested in the whole person, all of us. And so we honor the Lord this way, and we serve the Lord this way. Now, Malachi, he, said, he, he looks at the, at the land, and God speaks to Malachi, the prophet's heart, and he says, these people have a problem, all right? And they need revival. And he begins to speak on behalf of the Lord to the people. And they're in desperate need of revival. And, and here's, here's the message of Malachi to the people. He said, listen, will a man rob God? You're robbing me. But you say, 
How have we robbed you? Good Baptist answer, isn't it? Of us? <laughs> How have we robbed you? He said, in your tithes and your offerings. You're cursed with the curse. You're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe in the storehouse so there may be food in my house. And then he says this, test me now in this. Test me, says Lord host. See that I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing until it overflows. Now, he says there's this, there's this, there's this central house that I bring my offering to so that the house needs may be met and God's place may be full and the needs may be taken care of. He says, so bring that. And it's not meant to be some kind of horrible obligation, but a blessing to us. Why? He says, because you will prove that God's your father. In other words, when the rest of the world is suffering from economic recession, depression, that we don't have to live that way. We don't have to live and moan and whine and cry because it doesn't matter what happens, you know, God's still going to take care of me. Uh, and, and you may not know it, but our government's like $34, $35 trillion in debt. It's a fake economy pop, propped up with fake poles and posts just to keep it in place. You, it's not going to sustain this way for much longer. I just think we can, it's like printing up monopoly money. It continues to lose value. And you can make up all you want, but there's no foundation for it, all right? So in real economic principles, it is bound to fail. And if and when it fails, what are you going to do? I mean, there's people all over the world right now who are living in failed economies. Hand to mouth. I'm going to one of them on Tuesday, one of those countries. It's sad. It's heartbreaking. I mean, one of the things that we kind of sneak into our luggage is a lot of medicine. Well, I thought that Bernie Sanders said Cuba had the greatest medicine in the world. Yeah, that's Bernie. You can't get medicine there. They can prescribe you something and charge you nothing for it. But if they give you nothing, you got nothing. <laughs> they got nothing. You can't find aspirin. One of the things I always say, please, please send children's Tylenol, send children cold and cough medicine, send, or bring arthritis cream for our elderly people. I mean, I had one pastor actually begin to cry when I gave him a bottle of Tylenol on the last trip. A simple bottle of Tylenol. And praise God, I'm glad he was trusting the Lord because God met his need. <laughs> All right? But what I'm saying is don't, don't put your trust in uh, a Democrat party or Republican party or an independent party. You better put your trust in God. You better not put your trust in Social Security. You better not put your trust in 401. Boy, that just evaporating daily, isn't it? <laughs> Your trust and your hope is found in the Lord. And God said, if you'll just honor me this way, I'll prove that I'm your God. And not only that, I'll open up the windows of heaven. I'll make sure your needs are met. And not only that, I'm going to rebuke the devil. Yeah, but that, that means that I mean, if I'm not giving, then I'm not experiencing the fact that God's evidence is my, in my life. He's my father, and I, I, I'm not opening up the windows of heaven. They're closed to me, and uh, the devil is devouring so much of what I have. I said this morning at, over at Magnolia Camp, I said, I don't know anybody that can get more uh, mileage out of a vehicle than Tim Strickland. I said, you just better be glad you tithe. <laughs> because God blesses us in so many ways that most of us never take thought of. There's so many things that don't happen to you that probably would have happened to you if you hadn't had that protection. But when we stop, then we stop the protection. And the enemy just gets loose and cuts loose in our life. The greatest thing about all this is that God is glorified in our life. He's seen in our life. It, it, let me just put that to fact number four is that if you choose to not obey the Lord, it's going to cost you more. It's just going to cost you more in the long run. How much money do we waste when we don't honor the Lord? How much money uh, was it Bill Stafford used to say, man, God, you know, you say I don't give a tithe, but God collects it. You're going to give it, it's going to be collected. The devil's going to steal it. How many things has God sustained in your home? in your, your automobile or, or your tires or even your battery life that I just believe that would have gone sooner if it hadn't been for the grace of God. You know, that's just silly. No, it isn't. I've experienced the grace of God and things holding up and holding on and working longer and, and as long as I was being faithful to the Lord. Or just blessings, what happened, just that you, well, I wasn't expecting that. Well, that was, that was a grace of God. That was a blessing from God. Well, that, that, that didn't cost me near as much as it was going to cost last. Oh, that was the grace of God. He says here we experience blessings or curses. 
depending on have we learned to honor God with what we have. You say, I don't believe that. Read your Bible. I mean, I'm willing to be contested on any of these points. And not only contested here in the pulpit, but contested, let's get our checkbooks out and compare them. All right, I'm willing to sit down my checkbook and compare it to your checkbook. Where I gave and what God did as a result of me giving. Versus what you gave and didn't get blessed by. I'm not talking, you may make a lot more money than I do, and you may give more money than I do, but I'm talking about giving a proportion. And so someone said, the Lord said, one guy told me, he said, it's not how much you write on that check, it's how much you write in the balance on the other side. <laughs> it may have been a big gift, but what did it, did it even cost you? Real giving brings us to a place of costing us. And if we're really going to experience the blessing of God, then we're just willing. We're just open. We're just say, okay, God, this is a way that, you know, you can secure me in my life, and I can be secured by you. I mean, in the Gospels, Jesus taught the disciples these principles. How many times did he talk about management of your, of your economy? How many parables about stewardship and handling your finances in a way that would glorify God and bring people into the kingdom? He said, I, I just wish the children of the kingdom were as wise in the use of unrighteous mammon as lost people are. That's the Joram's translation of it, but it's the same thing. He said, we just learn how to honor God, and God honors us. How many miracles can, can I track back? How, how many miracles? I think Kathy and I were talking about this many times. About how many miracles just happened? Because we know that God did that in, 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 in just as grace and mercy, and he also did it because we were being faithful in those areas. We were faithful, and he just met a need. I mean, I buy houses cheap. I live in a $700,000 home that cost me $180,000. How would you do that? God. God did that. I mean, you don't believe that. Well, I can show you the checkbook. <laughs> we, we experience God's grace and blessings in so many different ways. It's almost hard to, to recognize it. But I do believe when he said, trust me, try me, and prove me, this, this is something you can track. If you really want to track, I can talk to Brother Ken Castleberry. We've talked about this before. about how you can, These things just become obvious and visible how God blesses you when you start doing what God's told you to do. And you can track them. And I know many of you can. And I, I know I'm not I'm preaching the choir in a lot of regards because many of you already know these principles. And when you step back and look, say, oh, yeah, that, that, that happened. And that, well, that wouldn't have normally happened. But God did, look at that too. Look what God did over here. When we learn these principles as, as, a, as a young single man and her as a young single woman, a woman and then marrying later, we've been practicing before we got married. And so we got married, we made a commitment to the Lord that we would first honor the Lord with those first fruits for sure. But we wanted to be givers. Learn how to give and give over and above what we just had because then we can experience greater blessing. As I said last week, these were the things that were taught to, me as a, taught to me as a very young man in the Lord, giving my heart and life to Jesus Christ, just saying, I want all God's got. I don't want to play games with God. I want to be serious about this. I want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And if that means my money, that means my money. Well, it's easy to say when I didn't have any. I'm making all of $50 a week. I think that was a big payday in ministry, serving the Lord on the street. But then, just seeing that God, the God, God was just blessed. And I, I don't have time to go over with you the multiple miracles. I've talked about them in the past that we've seen from our children's birth, having not a dime in the bank to cover the, 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 the benefits and, and not having to charge it and pay the hospital back. How God just, when our giving was honored, he just took care of our baby's birth. Just somebody, the last person in the world we thought would ever come in through, just didn't even know they really understood where we were at. They said, hey, we want to cover the cost of your child's birth. Oh, I can't let you do that, please. <laughs> How many times, though, not just in the past but in the present, have we seen the Lord just open a door of blessing simply because we just chose to be faithful? And I know many of you who have that same testimony. But... I really believe, again, that that's just a starting point, you know. It's just a place where we begin in serving the Lord. It's just that we should learn how to be more faithful. Faithful a little, master over much. But learning how to do that. So when God, when we start learning this, then it's like God, you know, we're partnering with him. We're, we're, we're doing what he's doing in the world today. We're, we're, we're part of the kingdom of God. He's got our hearts, and he knows he's got our hearts because he's got our wallets. One preacher said, you know, we baptize folks. We ought to baptize them with their wallets. Get it baptized too. But people sit back, well, I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll do what I want. I just got there. We're just missing the blessings of God. 
Well, Brother Joe, I still believe it's under the tithe. Well, it was, but it was before the tithe. It's a basic biblical principle on ma managing. We read from Proverbs a while ago. You know, give of the first fruits. What does that mean? A portion, a tenth. Give the first fruits so your barns may be full. Again, I learned this as, as a young single man, and I had no money whatsoever. But I remember the first time my brother and I, we were living together and, and doing ministry together on the streets. And so uh, Manly Beach, they came and talked to us about faith giving, which goes beyond this, by the way, folks. This is where every, this is baby giving 10%. I'll say that again. That's baby giving. And he said, and started talking to us about what God would do. And so we just, that, that's incredible. Got a Bible. That's what the Bible teaches. But we, didn't have we just went home and started giving what we had away. We gave shoes and clothes and, you know, anything we could do. We had some big needs, too. We had a need for a facility because we were just having a Bible study, a coffee house ministry in basically a built-out garage in, in the house we were living in. And they were already packing that thing out with kids. And so we're just giving, I mean, within, within a couple of days, there was a knock on the door. And it's a guy with tears in his eyes standing at the door. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm a pastor from the, uh, from the Friends Church over in Chapel Hill. And I said, okay, come on in. So Phil and I sat down with him. What's going on? He says, I've just had this, this burden in my heart. He says, you know, we, we have a building in Chapel Hill we don't even use anymore. We've been talking about selling it, but I just, don't, I just think the Lord wants us to give it to you guys. What's the deal? I said, oh, yeah. Oh, you don't have to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but Phil and I just looked at each other like, this stuff works. <laughs> this is incredible what God does. But th that's the history of this church, folks. I've had people say, you know, we get in financial window like we're in right now and things are, well, we should cut back on missions. That's the last thing we're ever going to cut back on. No, that, you, you don't cut back your giving. You, I think you increase your giving in difficult times. And see what God does. Well, you can't outgive God. I haven't met a person who's ever tried, but we ought to. This, this is a beginning place of joy and victory, and it's, it's a place of grace. And by the way, you know, it is, it is just the starting place. It's, it's where we begin. From that grace, if you want to know the truth, requires more. Now, again, let me just say this. You know, the FDA requires we put a warning label on. Not really. Uh, if you're just paying tithe to increase your income, receive the praise of men, or grudgingly out of fear of God's displeasure, or any other, you just don't expect much pleasure or blessing. You do this out of love. You do this because you recognize God's the source of everything you have in your life. You do it because you want to honor God, and you truly are a child of God, and you want to participate in the glory of God and the kingdom of God. But grace, let's go back to the argument of grace, all right? Doesn't grace really require more of us? In grace, it says, you know, uh, giving pr proves the sincerity of my love. So wouldn't it follow that deeper giving reveals deeper love? Well, I don't want to put it that way. I think we have to learn how to translate our love into action. We say we love the Lord. Somebody put this way, put your money where your mouth is. You say you love the Lord, then, then where is your giving? Where, where's the proof of your sincerity of giving? Oh, well, just, it's just the law. Hey, put on your logic hat just for a moment. I don't like to use logic because, you know, God has supernatural principles that defy logic. But under the logic hat, <laughs> thou shalt not commit murder. That's the law. But do we murder? No. In fact, under grace, Jesus says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Wow. That went a little overboard, didn't it? No. We're under grace. Under grace, we've been given so much that we know how to forgive. We know how to love, even when we're not being loved back. We're, we're under grace. Under grace, it says, don't commit adultery. I mean, under the law, don't commit adultery. So we're under grace, so let's go commit adultery. No. It's part of God's moral law. We're not going to commit adultery. We know that that's, that's against God's character. But Jesus said, if you have adultery in your heart, if you're lusting after another person in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. That's under grace. So what I'm saying is that grace far exceeds anything that the law ever required because grace operates by faith and by love. And grace requires our, our whole heart, not just some kind of rule-following structure of things. We just give our whole heart. And I realize that God does want to bless me. 
God does want to, to use me. God does want to fill my life. Doesn't mean God wants to make me rich like all of those prosperity preachers teach, but the principle of giving and receiving is still true. Given, it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. That's where I want to live my life, in the abundance of whatever God has for me in my life. So that not that I can just get. It's not about the getting. It's about the giving. Another great Bill Stafford quote. We become a warehouse of distribution. That I realize that I can be trusted by God. Money's a powerful influence. You don't believe me? Just wait till somebody in your family dies and there's an inheritance. Right? Money can be a powerful influence and it can make people go crazy. But for the child of God, it shouldn't. We should realize it's just a, it's a means that we, that, that we can be a blessing to the, to the kingdom of God and God blesses me as a result of it. Praise the Lord. I, I'm just going to go with whatever he does. But I, I want you to know that there's a way to, to make your giving effective and it's starting with that first fruits. That, that's where it begins. And you should give it. I, I put up here how, how to get the most, but it's not really getting the most. I, I should have changed that. How to, how, to, how to have the most effective offering in your life. And it, start, it starts pretty simple for the child of God. For the Christian, we just give willingly. You know, you don't have to have to come to church on Sunday and the pastor's got to get a pry bar and pry it out of your wallet. You know, give it. We're all going to die and die of starvation. If we're, you know, y'all seen those people who, who take offerings like that or, you know, you've been in services where they show all the terrible pictures of horrible things and they want you to give. Uh, motivation gets back to Jesus first and foremost. I mean, we all have empathy, amen? I'm not putting that down. But give willingly. Give generously. Don't be stuck on a, a portion that's just, just that. And, and, and many of you know this already. You give generously. You give be over the, over the 10%. You give it into the church. And you also give outside. I know you, you, we do as well. We support some different ministries and with some different organizations. And the, on top of that, benevolence that we do to help. We know brothers and sisters who may be struggling to a financial crisis at this point in time of their life. We, we give to that. And... and but it's just a matter of just learning how to be a generous person. And with that generosity comes joy. You know, you just you learn how to discover the joy in life and joy in giving. It's not like, you know, that you just, oh, man, do I need my wallet out? And, you know, that's one of the reasons I don't pass the plate. I always felt like we were at a funeral service during the time of the offerings, like time of mourning. Softly the music's playing on the piano. Some guy's going by with a plate holding it in front of you. You feel like everybody's looking to see if you're going to put something in, you know. And there's always that guy who crumples up that bill, throws it in the offering, or the guy who likes to fold it 40 times. The $1 bill. Those poor guys who count the offering around here, bless their heart, when they go out and wad your bill, you know. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's just like your, your plate went by and you just had to give, say goodbye to your best friend. The biblical model is offering urns. And receptacles, all right? And that's why we do that. It should be just something that's joyful. You're excited about it. I don't know about you. We write scriptures on our checks, and we give by check. Sometimes we give by, by electronic funds. But it's just write a scripture on there. Write, you know, Luke 6, 38. Given it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. Learn to be excited about your giving. Learn to give with a heart that's not only excited, hey, but learn how to give with a thankful heart. Because that's where it really comes from, isn't it? We realize that everything I have has come from another place called God. God's given me these blessings. God's given me a job. God's given me an opportunity. And, and be thankful. Some of you may be without it right now. You understand how thankful we are when we get it, right? Don't lose that. Don't lose that expectation that God has done these things for you and, and, and blessed you in your life. But give with an expectation of, of Luke 6, 38. God said, if I would do this, he would bless me. Not doing it for the blessing, but I am expecting a blessing. But that's not the reason I do it. But I'm expecting a blessing because I give in faith. I give. God said I'd give. He'd give back. All right. So I don't give it back, get it back just to keep it. I give it back so I, I get it back so I can give some more of that. The Bible talks about the abundant life of the believer when Paul's talking to the church in Corinth. And he said, listen, God is able to meet your need. All right. He supplied seed for the sower with enough left over to give away. So really, what is abundance in the Christian life? It's having God meet my needs, and I have stuff left over. 
But it starts with giving what comes in to start with, with an expectation. And the last points are this, and the last slide, there's two one right after this, but this one has several points on it. And these are life-changing, and these are just the benefits, and we've mentioned some of them already. It makes you more like the Lord. Why? Because God so loved the world that he did what? Did he give just a portion? No. He bankrupt heaven on our behalf in his own son. It draws me, I believe, really. Any, time, any act of obedience always draws me. Any act of yieldingness always draws me closer in my walk to the Lord. I enjoy his fellowship on a, even on a deeper level. It is victory over materialism, which is the plight of the American home. We just think if we can get more, we can be happy. Why does everybody want to come to America? So they can get more, have more. That's not what life's all about. Don't be sucked into that illusion that's presented to you everywhere you turn. It's built into us, that greed and that covetousness. And this is the way we break the greed and the covetousness in our heart. We just learn how to be givers. It strengthens my faith. Why? Because the Lord said, test me and try me. I can see the evidence. If I take time to pray and look and really pay attention, I will see what God has done. And fifth is simple. Hey, from that, it becomes a real investment into eternity. We're getting ready to go to Cuba Tuesday because people invested back in our last Christmas offering for missions and ministry. We're going to be able to take and pour that into lives in Cuba, all right? And from there, it'll go into other lives. It'll, we're, those seven pastors that we'll talk to, they all have 70 friends apiece, and they'll go share those things with them, and they'll share it with their churches, and the churches will share it with the lost world. So it's an investment, amen, in what God's doing. We're all a part of that. And we rejoice in that. You're not going. I'm going. If you want to go, you're more than welcome to go. All right? But you better like rice and beans and no air conditioning. And mosquitoes. you got to love mosquitoes. Or take you a good can of off with DEET. These are vicious. Battery-powered pan, a fan doesn't hurt either. So make sure you got a battery-powered fan. But the idea is we go to, to give ourselves in another way. Paul said, listen, hey, some are going to be sent, you know, some got to go. How, how can people hear unless they be sent? So how are those folks going to hear? Some, someone sent. Who sent? You sent. And how can they be sent, you know, uh, unless somebody has to do the sending? And so we're, we work in the context of the kingdom of God. Yes, and it's the same here in America. What we do with our dollars for the kingdom of God is to reach this world. We've got to get off our behinds, all right? Some of you come in here every Sunday, and I love you. But, hey, you never invite anybody. You never take the time to just invite folks to church. Some of you are doing great. I give you an A+. Plus. Keep on going. Keep on doing it. But some, we just get content. We get comfortable. We have a men's dinner. Well, I guess I've got to say, no, we ought to start making the entrance to the men's dinners two guests. <laughs> Food's free, but you've got to bring two guests. Well, you know what happens? A lot of guys say, I don't want to bring two guests. I have to talk about Jesus to somebody. I really don't want to do that. Isn't that unfortunate? We just, everything we do, the ladies' retreat, the men's retreat, the men's dinner, the ladies' dinner, the youth retreat, the camp, everything is built with intent inside of it to, this is the way we can bring more people to Jesus. Let's do it. Let's invite kids to camp. Let's invite kids to youth retreat. Let's invite adults to the Bible study. Let's get somebody in the lift group. Let's, let's, let's keep constant in this work of the kingdom with our time and our talent and our treasures. It blesses me. I'm a happy guy. I hope you are. But my happiness is not dependent upon my happenings. My happiness is dependent upon my walk with God. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't live in guilt about this. I don't, I'm, I don't live in guilt. Sometimes I, I, I feel guilty because I, I think maybe I'm not nearly giving enough. That's what, so I'm trying to be faithful to give as the Lord leads me to give and gives me direction. And there's some things that are just obvious, like this proportional giving start right away. And there's other things I need to pray about. And other things the Lord puts on my heart. I need to pray about. He just put it on my heart. And so we were faithful to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And he guides us in all these things. And, and, and we're participating and working with him. It just brings grace. It brings me joy. It brings me happiness in the Lord to know that I'm doing what he's called me to do. I mean, is that scripture true on the wall or not? Is it? If it's true, it's true. It's more blessed to give. You say, well, I kind of like receiving, Pastor. I do, too. I, I may have the gift of receiving. I don't know. <laughs> That's a joke, okay. It is more blessed to give. Folks are, you know, I kind of like getting a check from folks. I like people handing me money. I like, I like saying, it's more blessed to give. But you know, I kind of like, you know, the boss gives me some extra money. That's nice. I, you may be blessed by that. 
but it's more blessed to give. Well, you know, that kind of, you know, I got some free tickets to the game. I really enjoyed that, and that was fun. And, you know, I said, hey, you know, I'm glad you were blessed. But it's more blessed to give. Now, just think how blessed you might have been by getting. It's more blessed, more happy. It's the word for happy in Scripture, makrios. It's a Greek word for being. We use for blessing all the time. But it means a state of really fullness and joy and contentment. Because that's real happiness. It doesn't got to do with anything with what's happening out there. It's what's happening in here the blessings of God in our life. That's my prayer. That's my hope that every Christian, every child of God has that kind of victory in their life that they're not walking in covetousness and greed. How often are we reminded of that in Scripture? Not to be bound by covetousness, not to be bound by selfishness, not to be bound by greed. And the only way to break the hold of those things is learn how to be a giver of your life. By giving yourself, your time, your talent, your treasures, learning how to surrender to the Lord. And you can't outdo that. You can't outgive God that. Trust me. Try me. Test me. See if I will not. That's a pretty big, that's the only thing God tells us to test him in, isn't it? In scripture that I can see. And we like to test him in a lot of the other areas in which we get in trouble for. This is when he's, oh, you're welcome. Try me in this deal. Just give and see. Just, just do the proportional thing and see if I want to go to heaven or not. How much are we robbing ourselves and robbing the kingdom when we won't be faithful in these first things? God has been so good to you, hasn't he? Amen. Has God been good to you? We've all suffered heartaches and loss and difficulties and problems and sickness and everything else. But man, God's been good to you. I should take you to Cuba and you'll see how God, good God has been to you. And see how what blessings that God has poured out on your life. But I want you to know there's no way we could ever repay God for all he's done for us. Just sending Jesus alone, there's no way. And we're not trying to repay God. We're just trying to express our love. So learn how to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your body, and your wallet. And see what God does in your life. Let's stand. Father, I thank you for the blessings that you shower on us and show us and minister to us in so many different ways. We can get so sidetracked, Lord, in this culture we're living in. We are bombarded on every side, Father, by a world that tells us that life is in getting and getting more. And too often, Lord, we believe them. And I ask you in Jesus' name that our hearts would be humble and we would realize just all that we have received at your hand. Even when we think we have little, we would have nothing, Father, if it had not been for your mercy and grace. You've given us this next breath. You've given us our friendships, our relationships, our loved ones. So, Lord, help us to understand that all belongs to you in reality. But you're the Lord, the earth is yours, the fullness thereof. And you let us be a part of it. God, forgive us when we've been selfish, self-concerned. Forgive us, Lord, when we've looked to others to meet our need without really coming to you and laying our burdens and our needs before you. You said you'd be faithful to us. You said you'd meet the need. Lord, you give us this simple premise of just yielding in all these areas of our heart and mind. Touch us, open our eyes, open our hearts. We'd just like to give a simple invitation today with our heads bowed. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's where it all starts. Give your heart, give your, your life. Surrender to Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. He loves you more than you could possibly imagine. His love for you is so wide, so vast, so great. It's been proven and evidenced by sending his own son to die for you. We don't merit that. We don't, we're not worth that. He did that out of love. Give your heart to Jesus today. I'd love to pray with you. Point you to Jesus today. Help you start your new walk in life again. So when we're worshiping the Lord in this moment here, feel free to come. Say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe looking for a church home. That's where the Lord's been leading you. Come say, hey, I want to be part of what God's doing. Maybe you just want to come to the altar between you and the Lord Jesus. Maybe there's something between you and someone else you need to, to take care of. But Whatever the Lord is saying to you, say yes to him today. Open your heart. Let God do something in you today. It'll change the course and the direction, the trajectory, literally, of your life when you'll get it aligned with him. Just learn how to be faithful in that which is little, at least. We worship you come. Surrender to the Lord, whatever the Lord's saying. You just come yield to the Lord in some area of your life. Come.
is a powerful name and we thank you that in that name that every knee every tongue will bow and confess to you that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord we speak that over our lives today. We have yielded, bowed our hearts and lives to you. God I pray that these areas sometimes that are difficult to us they're only difficult because we make it difficult. Free us and liberate us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. You may be seated. And just because pastor's gone next Sunday doesn't mean you need to be gone. Be here. Be a part of the body. Bring someone with you. It's going to be a great service in the Lord. It's going to be a great day in the Lord. You don't want to miss it. If that's just the richest times in your life. One day you're going to sit back and say, there were times when I was in fellowship with my believer friends in the body of Christ. And I believe that's true. Some of the richest times of all have been uh, spent with you, whether it's been in services or in, in ministry or retreat somewhere and sometimes just in your home. Uh, nobody, you know, realizes many times the connections that pastors 
really develop with people in a church. And uh, whether you realize it or not, it's there. Whether you understand it or not, it's there. And I believe that should I need you, you're there. Should you need me, I'm here. And so we lean on each other. We pray for each other. We believe God together. So we need your prayers on this trip, especially as we go, that God just do something really supernatural in hearts and lives. Let it, let it begin with me. Amen? Praise the Lord. Brother Matt, who's just making announcements? No announcements? I'm making announcements? Okay. <laughs> uh, journey class today at 3 o'clock. I got that one. It's on the back wall. Be here. If you, hey, if you haven't done the, the journey class, the one-on-one class, you've just missed a blessing. Get a little more testimony and heartbeat of what the church is about. Second announcement is don't miss your Bible studies and lift group. I know some of you met this morning, but, hey, we're still in this study on crowns. It's a great, great time in the Lord. Don't forget Kids of Wanda Club tonight, youth group tonight, cell group, slide Bible study. If you're one of the evening Bible studies, be a part of that as well. Hey, Wednesday night Bible studies, you don't want to miss it. We're getting ready to get finalized, the one uh, with, that we've had with uh, our other studies. But now, Wednesday night Bible studies, Pastor Matt's going to bring you a word from the Word of God. You don't want to miss it. See, he hadn't been working on announcements. He's been working on the Bible study for Wednesday night. So be prepared for that. All right, I already told you about Cuba, so please, if you, you can sign up, be on our prayer list. If you want to fast one of those days, feel free to do that as well. Hey, Family Fun Night movie is going to be on October the 28th. This is not just fun for your family. Bring someone. These events, again, are designed for us. To, hey, let's bring somebody and introduce them to our friends at church, all right? And bring them to the family. So use these opportunities that God's given us. Then also our distribution day is coming up for the kids' winter distribution. You don't want to miss that as well. Your tithes and your offerings. Are, oh, y'all just got a ton of me Y'all paying attention still, right? And you're loving me suffer through this. I know that. Garage sale, November the 5th. Get with Matt. Get with Pam. If you have any questions on that, what to do, you can get a lot there. Bring your junk you had collecting for the years. Get rid of it. Does somebody pay for it even? Come do that as well. And, of course, there's some proceeds from renting the tables to go to the church. And get connected. Please go to online. Let me tell you something you can do before the day's out. Go online and give the church a like, all right? Or even better... Do a review. If you look it up in Google, it's got a place for reviews. Do a review on your church. You'd be surprised if people looking for a church home, how many times they look, if, if there are any reviews. So just, hey, go brag on your church a little bit. Give reviews. Say, I loved it so much, I, I'm still there. I joined, all right? And if you, how many guests were here today? First time you've ever been to Believer's Fellowship, raise your hand. Anybody? If you're not raising your hand, you're here anyway. I'm going to be out in the lobby. I'd love to meet you. Don't forget your giving. I don't think I need to say anything else about that. Hallelujah. Let's stand up, would you? Turn around and shake somebody's hand and say, I'm glad I was in church today. God bless you.